Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the stretching. Uh, it was not as relaxing as planned, so that was also a bit of boxing, but in any case, you are now full of energy for our next session on solar to hydrogen. We could hear it in the past session, which was also looking into uh, businesses. When it comes to greening our industries, one keynote to crack is how to drive the decarbonization of so-called hard to abate sectors, such as heavy industry, aviation, and shipping. Those sectors are often hard to electrify and very energy intensive. This is why renewable hydrogen seems to emerge as a missing link. And I am absolutely delighted to moderate our session on solar for hydrogen, which will explore how solar and renewable hydrogen can drive our industrial future, help us achieve the last mile of decarbonization, and make sure that renewable hydrogen becomes a true European industrial success story. Needless to say that in order to achieve this, we should not be colorblind. Today, 99% of hydrogen production is so-called gray and is responsible for 70 to 100 million tons of CO2 emissions in Europe. In order to set the scene and discuss how we can make it a success, I'm very happy to welcome my distinguished panel. Christian Foduc, which is Managing Director for Hydrogen at Smart Energy and also the Vice Chair of our Renewable Hydrogen Workstream. Karina Krastel, which is Commercial Director for the European Green Hydrogen Acceleration Center, an initiative which has been developed recently by Inno Energy and Breakthrough Energy. And Ulrich Stridback, which is Vice President, Head of Rel Regulatory Affairs at Orsted. Thank you so much to you three for attending this summit and being with me today on this panel. Without further ado, I would like you, Christian, as our vice chair, to set the scene. And in particular, help us understand the following elements. What is the state of play for renewable hydrogen? How can solar, which is becoming increasingly competitive, contribute to making it uh, a success story and to accelerating the competitiveness of renewable hydrogen in the medium term? And also, what do you see as the key policy mild milestones? I hope it will help us uh, set the discussion. Christian, you have five minutes. And you should unmute yourself, probably. Okay, I think only now you can hear me. It's very pleased to give a quick overview and we can move already to the next slide. I mean, what is the state of play of renewable hydrogen? And here, in fact, it's about the projects which are happening. And like last year, a few years ago, we always started to think about what hydrogen can make in the various applications, all the different ecosystems, all the different offtake routes, the different production where renewable hydrogen comes from. But the reality is, Projects now, and especially this year, are happening. Uh, and in their various stages, preparing for different competitiveness in the various uh, routes. Um, and uh, just to say, High Deal uh, looks into how can we get 1.5 euro per kilogram by 2030, orange butt, elect uh, decarbonizing ceramics, et cetera, et cetera. The e-fuel, which uh, already also mentioned, Norsk e-fuel, a real project in, in the north. Uh, North H2, high deal, high flex power, Airbus with the aviation. So just to give you a little uh, glimpse, the projects are happening, they are in development, and how can we support it through the solar side? Uh, next slide, please. Well, uh, we have uh, seen they are hard to abate uh, industries, so we cannot do all the electrification or um, by the efficiency uh, approach and significant important parts and the heat generation and obviously in the uh, transportation sector. And you can see on these charts here, uh, the amount of terawatt hours in the various scenarios for 20, 30, 40, 50, uh, for both categories, which I just mentioned, there is a huge amount which cannot be fully electrified, which cannot be done by electric, um, sorry, by uh, efficiency gains. And so, hydrogen has a very important role to play in order to reach the full target. Next slide, please. Well, the good news is that the competitiveness has been increasingly developing. Obviously, the levelized cost of electricity plays a major role in this uh, cost curve, but also the electrolyzer costs. And we already say today that um, compared to the worst performers with conventional uh, generation of hydrogen, 
the renewable already can start to be competitive. On the left hand side, you see how the levelized cost of hydrogen goes down, reaches this, tar reaches this target sector between, uh, let's say, 1.5, 2.5 euro per kilogram. And you can see on the left hand side, how this compares, in fact, with an uh, alternative like natural gas with uh, CCS, carbon storage, capture and storage, and also the, the coal uh, option. And by 2050, we can see we reach even potential below $1 per kilogram. And there is already uh, expectations that we reach the 1.50 euro by 2030 already. Uh, next slide, please. Well, now uh, we come to, to figures, an amount of uh, electricity, which is obviously in this solar power summit, a very important part. And looking into these sectors, as said, energy intensive industry, heavy duty transport, aviation, shipping, these contribute to a very important demand. And uh, according to a new study by Materia Economics, a full 500, 540 terawatt hours of green hydrogen demand for the EU is expected. And the question is how to make it. And you can see also the, the split on this chart on the right hand side, how the 550 correspond to the total demand of the sector. So uh, then towards 40, 2040 and 50, even more to go. Next slide, please. All right. So staying with the 540 terawatt hours this translates roughly depending which uh, renewable energy source you take and loading factors and stuff like that 120 gigawatt of additional renewable energy source is expected you can see on the right hand side the current solar wind solar and wind capacity the growth needed for the eu 65 percent target of renewable penetration and now comes the additional needed renewable energy sources in order in this model to assume that 70 percent of the 540 terawatt hours demand are produced in europe well it's also about import topics and there's even scenarios with higher demand so this is a very important addition to the strategy coming and uh, driven by the need for hydrogen to fully decarbonize hard to bait sectors next slide please so solar energy, key enabler for the renewable hydrogen uptake. As said, the levelized cost of electricity is the main key driver. And luckily we have seen a decade of amazingly falling PV uh, um, costs and uh, electricity costs by renewables, especially PV, actually being now the most competitive overall on the right hand side. I mean, that's nothing new in this conference. Utility scale PV plays a very, very crucial role to scale, to give the uh, amount needed of electricity, but also the costs we need. Next slide, please. Well, having said all that, let, let's look into what is needed to accelerate the uptake of renewable hydrogen. And this is the position which uh, by um, Solar Power Europe and the hydrogen work stream we have taken in order to support the measures uh, in order to ramp hydrogen as fast as possible, but also keep in mind, we want to have renewable hydrogen uh, as the primary focus of uh, new technology to be supported. And the one is the ambitious EU taxonomy for clean hydrogen. We need exactly uh, uh, to avoid investments into new polluting assets and the thresholds, which are mentioned here on the slide, are intended to enable hydrogen production and also the emissions threshold for electricity production to a level which is focused on really decarbonize uh, and not to invest into potential stranded assets. Then yes, leverage the of it too. So cost competitiveness of renewable based hydrogen solution versus conventional ones. Uh, this is the second and I cannot go obviously through all the details here right now. Next slide, please. Uh, build a future-proof hydrogen infrastructure on the 10E regulation. The electricity grids need to work together. Hydrogen clusters locally. Uh, blending is not what we're looking for, maybe just to help initial off-taking issues. And last point, a market design for renewable hydrogen. We need really to establish, also with governmental support, the market for hydrogen with the corresponding uh, measures, as you can see on this slide. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Christian. I think uh, you already provided us with a very broad picture uh, and a lot of elements on which we're going to be able to, to deep dive uh, during this session. So the build out of renewables, the market design and, and appropriately developing the framework in order to enable the offtake. So the, the overarching theme of our discussion is really how we can power Europe's renewable hydrogen ambition from supply to demand. And as a very good businesses that we are, our clients come first. So let's start from the perspective of the consumer. And I would like to start with you, Karina. Uh, Christian alluded to quite a strong potential, actually, for the direct offtake of green hydrogen. It was 514 terawatt hour, which could be available in the near term. That's a bit surprising because you often hear that blue hydrogen will drive the bulk of an industrial demand in the next five years. So is it not the case? And actually, what is happening on the ground from your perspective? And what are the success fi factors to enable a direct offtake of renewable hydrogen? Yeah, thank you, Aurélie. Um, so first, before I answer your question, I quickly introduce uh, EIT in Energy. Um, in order to get perspective of who is speaking. So EIT in Energy, we're a public-private partnership initiated uh, and still funded by the European Commission. And our objective is to accelerate innovation in the energy sector in Europe. And we do that through a lot of different activities, one of which is our value chain uh, initiative. Uh, and this is also what I'm going to talk to you about today. So we have the European Green Hydrogen Acceleration Center that we've initiated, let's say, last year as part of our value uh, chain initiatives. And um, next slide, please. When we speak about value chain initiative, what that, uh, does that mean? And what does it mean in the hydrogen context? So for us, looking at hydrogen projects from a value chain perspective uh, means that we don't do what you see on that slide. That means uh, in order to also foster demand, uh, we cannot continue uh, to work uh, in an industrial setting, setting how we've worked before with the traditional model, meaning that each actor looks at their own plate, looks at their own margin, looks at their own risk uh, and passes on that risk and also that margin to the next person in the chain. What we believe is if we continue to do that, we will get a car that in the end is the end product of, for example, a steel uh, value chain that we're trying to decarbonize that will be too expensive and where projects just don't fly because the risk cannot be taken uh, and cannot be shared with all the actors. And that's why what we want to avoid as a European initiative is that we, our end consumers, have to go and buy a Tesla from Nevada and can, can't buy, let's say, a family car, uh, let's say one of the European brands, uh, Renault, for example. So that's my next slide, please. That's why what uh, we are looking for and what we want to build as part of the European Green Hydrogen Acceleration Center together with partners, we want to build uh, projects, hydrogen projects and green hydrogen or renewable hydrogen projects from a value chain perspective. Meaning we want to create a pull uh, from the market in bringing actors together around the table and sharing risks and also benefits of future projects in order to really foster demand and also in order to lower the premium that will uh, cause the end product to be in the end uh, shared with end customers. So that means if we can create that kind of pool, the premium will be low and those products can also be sold to the market and therefore we can create a demand and a market pool and hydrogen projects can fly without too much dependence on regulations as what we see today. Next slide, please. And we already have one of those examples and that's why I'm really thankful that I get the opportunity to, pr uh, to um, present you that project today because it really illustrates how we can create a green hydrogen uh, projects from a demand perspective. So this is a greenfield uh, steel project in the north of Sweden. Not so much solar power there, uh, but you could replicate something like this also in the south. Um, and the idea here is in energy, we have invested in that project as one of the early investors together with Vargas uh, in order to produce green, a green steel using green hydrogen uh, in a green field, 5 million tons. Start off of the plant is 2024 and final full production by 2030. And what is the innovative part behind that here is that we've really followed that value chain approach and we started with the demand, meaning with the end customer in mind. And when we talk about steel, the end customer is not the steel manufacturer, but the car producer or the car manufacturer that can pass on that premium. 
and mm -hmm. um, and therefore that project has been done for example together with Scania who is a truck manufacturer who is willing to buy green steel and willing to be part of, of such an initiative together with Bildstein Group or SMS Group who are con construction related companies and we believe that uh, we can build such kind of initiatives not only in the steel value chain but also in other green or renewable hydrogen value chains such as for example fertilizer etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. may i may i ask you karina because we, we, when you you talk about building this ecosystem um what what is your role why, why is it not happening just by itself because we're talking about companies that are quite mature quite big so what's the matter I think what we see uh, from the field is that it's very complex. Let's say the steel um, value chain is relatively simple, but even there it's complex to bring together actors around the table and also, like I showed you before, this image to co-create the project. This is relatively complicated because we have a traditional way of thinking, which is my business model, my margin, my risk. And this needs to be overcome in order to co-create. And I think there is a real complexity to bring together those actors. And that is also our role as an independent entity uh, with the European perspective, a public entity as well, to help those initiatives get off the ground. Mm -hmm. Maybe, uh, thank you, Ulrich. Christian, do you have a comment on that, on building the, the value chain? Is there anything which you think uh, it would be relevant also for an initiative such as EGAC? What is blocking from your perspective on the ground? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's always this kind of combination between the ambitions of large scale hydrogen production to get costs down on the other side, the off taking side, which uh, want to make use of the hydrogen really in terms of uh, the pure hydrogen as it is. And this kind of off take actually needs to be built. There is the lucky situation of a completely green field approach where everything fits maybe exactly in the very beginning. But the reality is we have a lot of industries which have to convert and this uh, happens gradually and so to to mm -hmm. mitigate the risk between this investment on the one hand side into the large scale generation and the offtake who right now cannot take the risk on long term purchase agreements on long term price commitment uh, there needs to be a, a, a bridge a bridging where governmental or other initiatives mm -hmm. need to take a responsibility to make these projects happen and on top of that these first projects are needed get the cost down, but they have the disadvantage of the highest costs compared to those who follow. So who takes this risk? And this is, I think, the, where the support needs to step in. Who takes this risk, Ulrich? Yeah, but if I may start uh, going back to your first question, Aurelie, I, 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 I uh, to a, a long stretch, agree with Karina, especially in, in highlighting that this is have to going to be demand driven it is demand driven uh, speaking about uh, hydrogen and derived green fuels is something very very different from just power in the wall as we've been used to 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 uh, approach this with with electricity i would say though however i wouldn't be too quick at at, at judging what's missing and what's uh, blocking here things are happening at absolutely breakneck uh, speed and uh, one thing that has for sure changed is that all these off takers that we talk about they are they are very very well aware they are very very prepared and they are they are really looking into this uh, very very seriously today mm -hmm. and i think it, it frankly changes uh, from day to day so uh, I, I'm sure the, the, the projects, uh, the, the, the proposition that we've seen is a very, very good one on, on green steel, uh, no doubt. But it is not so that everyone sits and wait for this. You know, we, there, there are tons of projects and we are pushing ahead. And the big difference is that uh, Nike, they, they want to have green transportation of their sneakers from Singapore. And um, people are, people are, you know, the, the offtake side, the demand side is really starting to see this in a very, very new light. And those bottlenecks, we are used to talking about uh, politicians that doesn't send enough money and uh, we need more subsidies, all these kinds of things. It, it's, it's different uh, in the hydrogen setup that we are talking about. 
It's also about government support, especially mm -hmm. to kick it off, as Christian said. But it's also very much about uh, getting other regulatory issues at place. And I think the big bottleneck here is the, the lack of electrons, frankly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ulrich. That's a perfect transition to my next question to you, actually. Uh, but it's good to hear, and, and maybe I'd like just to, to take that. It, it's good to hear that there is not so much as a blockage as we would think, because it's true that a lot of people are talking about hydrogen at the moment, and you sometimes get this feeling that renewable hydrogen will not be there before 2030. You have some stakeholders saying that. And what we see, not to mention the, the Bloomberg New Energy Finance uh, prospects, which were mentioned by Christian earlier, and what I hear from you from the ground is actually, no, it's kind of happening, and, and it's kind of happening as a fast pace, if we consider that two years ago there was there was nothing. So that's, uh, that's really good to, to hear. Looking at the lack of electrons, uh, which obviously is another very important topic, end users also need not only a lot of electrons, but competitive electrons. So, Ulrich, how are we doing on this side? How are we delivering those additional renewable capacities? Are we on track to, to reach the targets which have been set by the European Commission for renewable hydrogen? Uh, no, we are struggling, uh, quite clearly. I am my own company. We are we are experts in in offshore wind, particularly in Europe. We also do uh, invest in solar, but so far mainly in the U.S. and and onshore wind. But no, we are not. It, it's not going uh, uh, forward uh, quickly enough. Uh, there's there's uh, there is not the uh, sufficient amount of, of projects. Uh, there are too many, uh, too much struggle uh, with that. So. So this is this is a true bottleneck, and um, may I about ask what are those struggles? Well, for example, for for offshore wind, which is uh, where I know most, um, we will not need that much space offshore at sea to fulfill European targets, but uh, it's busy out at sea. Uh, first of all, uh, there has to be room for biodiversity and we need to we, we can't ruin the environment by when when trying to save it but there is also fishery interests uh, oil and gas interests uh, shipping interests it's it's busy and figuring that out how to find that space is ongoing but it's it's also very uh, acute so at least for offshore wind that's one and the other obvious one as we uh, as we always know and which we we share as a bottleneck with, with solar PV is, is the lack of the grid. It's uh, mm -hmm. the, the grid is is just not there. For for hydrogen, especially I think for offshore wind, this is on the other hand also the great opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if I'm if I may, you were talking about the competitiveness. Uh, the way we look at this is that it, it com it comes in in, in, in three groups, so to speak, uh, that competitiveness, at least for the hydrogen. The first group is we need to have a better and cheaper electrolysis. Today, most, most uh, observers agree that this will happen. It's already happening, as we saw on Christian's slide, and uh, no mm -hmm. doubt. Uh, secondly, we need the cheap electrons. Uh, this mm -hmm. has been happening for, for years now. Solar, wind, onshore, offshore, its costs are reducing and we are competitive. Renewable energy is the preferred choice. Um, the final chunk is the grid. Uh, the difference between connecting electrolysis to the grid and paying for the grid uh, uh, on one hand and alternatively being able to connect intelligently in the grid where the, where the production is that can constitute massive savings, according to our modeling, 25, 30% savings for society. Mm -hmm. And of course, it also ends up being an extremely important part of the business case. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ulrich. Uh, I, I know that, uh, I mean, interesting, and we'll, we'll come back to the question on the bottleneck, because of course, to, to, to drive cost abatements, we need volumes. 
to, to, to deliver on the volumes. We need many other stuff uh, which uh, the European Commission has to deliver on. Uh, maybe I have a question for you, Karina, on the offtake side, but I will go back to Christian. Do you have some complementary elements when it comes to driving down the competitiveness of renewable hydrogen, making it competitive as soon as possible for our European businesses? Yeah, yeah. I would comment quickly on two things, electrolyzer and the electricity. Uh, as Ulrich already mentioned, the one on electrolyzer is that we see still a lot of pathway, not only in the cost, but also in the efficiency, obviously. Uh, there is uh, uh, topics like how much conversion is done. Like today, we're on the 60% range conversion efficiency. If we look into, for example, solid oxide, you can get to 80%, which would be a quantum leap uh, in advance uh, in the future. Also, other topics like the over, overall cost, OPEX over time, stack exchange, durability of stacks, things like that. I mean, there we are in the beginning of, of industrialization of large scale electrolyzers. So there's a lot of potential uh, coming. The second on the electricity, uh, in fact, PV is the, is, is, is the winner in terms of LCOE right now already. Great. Uh, the other thing is load factor, loading factor. Uh, the generation profile is, is difficult and combining, that's a chance to combine actually different renewable energy sectors together, making also by regulatory uh, uh, um, potential uh, rules uh, it possible without paying too much uh, on the system to put these things together. And then you can get to very uh, attractive loading factors. PV and wind obviously is a very, very nice match you get from, let's say, depending where you are, 30% to 50% uh, loading factor or more. Uh, and then suddenly the business case becomes much more attractive. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christian. Um, I would like to, to maybe close the, uh, the, the topic of competitiveness before dig diving a bit more into the question of, of a renewable build out, which is indeed really, really critical. Karina, from the perspective of the off taker, so we see the competitiveness really uh, following an exponential curve as it has been the case for other renewable technologies. In the meantime, uh, what are initiatives like EGAC going, doing concretely to facilitate this offtake, uh, if you already came on it uh, before, no need to expand further, but also in terms of instruments and political instruments, what do you think can help or be the most efficient in bridging, bridging this gap for the offtake of renewable hydrogen? Yeah, so first of all, maybe I can, what you ask uh, was, what do we do or what are the tools that uh, are out there to help uh, the offtake of renewable hydrogen? So there, I think the ECAC uh, can really help uh, projects, industrial projects uh, to de-risk uh, the investment, uh, first of all, but also accelerate time to market. And normally we do that through like a lot of different, let's say, services that we provide to projects. So mainly one key aspect is to identify off-takers and there, I agree uh, with what has been said today that there is a lot of, let's say, awareness that is being created around that, but really doing that step, talking to the off taker bringing them together, I think that is still lacking in a lot of projects and that's where really we can help and that's where a lot of organizations like ours can help. But then also mm -hmm. we can help with access to finance, for example, to support projects to get a blended uh, finance mix, so public-private financing access to funding, et cetera. So there are a lot of different, I think, uh, activities that can be done in order to really get a bankable business cases off the ground. Um, and uh, when it comes to, uh, let's say, really concretely speaking, we have, for example, a business investment platform where companies and projects can come to and where we can help uh, do that really practically speaking uh, mm -hmm. with hands-on, let's say, hands-on activity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Karina. Yeah, a comment? All right. Uh, so maybe to, to follow up, indeed. Uh, um, so once we support we support the off takers, we make sure that cost competitiveness uh, keeps uh, keeps coming down or at least keeps increasing. And we're still facing the issue of the renewable build out because at the end of the day, producing hydrogen is 30 uh, percent less efficient than using electricity uh, directly. We heard yesterday uh, the Secretary General of Hydrogen Europe urging the European Commission not to have too strong requirements for additionality, uh, at least in the near term, uh, when it comes to, to renewable hydrogen, because it could be a barrier to the uptake uh, of the market. But if we cannot build on the electricity side, how is it going to solve itself in the next five years? That, that's a big question uh, for me. And, and maybe, yeah, I would like to hear maybe your views, Christian, on the role of additionality. 
how can we ensure that we build more renewables and how can we solve the very concrete bottlenecks that we have here? Yeah, in fact, the additionality principle is meant to be that we don't cannibalize, as you said, uh, the electrification. And in fact, there is a, a efficiency loss. You have more CO2 in the atmosphere if you convert electricity from uh, renewable energy sources from electrification to uh, hydrogen uh, first. This is not the in intention. Uh, but we need to be very careful because uh, the additionality which intends that we do additional, uh, if however the projects with the hydrogen are to build industries which then have a demand which then in fact uh, does, does this additional, uh, how can I say, decarbonization, if these projects don't take off and not on the short term don't take off until 2025, we have already gigawatt scale electrolyzer planned by the targets of Europe. If these don't happen, then the next ones also will not happen until 2030. And these 540 terawatt hours I was mentioning before will just not happen. Uh, so we then have uh, the contrary of what the additionality principle uh, was intended for. So we need to be very careful to, to uh, how to implement it, uh, at which very early moment it sh shall be in place. We need just first projects to get started, that the proof of concept is done on large scale electrolyzers. And after that, obviously, we need to make sure that we don't cannibalize. Also, we make, need to make sure that we have no cross subsidies. Uh, one thing is, if you just take electricity from a PV to hydrogen, which in a way has been supported for another reason, mm -hmm. that's not the intention of hydrogen. So there's a few things to, to, to think about, but we need some flexibility and reali reali reality. We are right now, uh, from smart energy side, already registering as renewable gas producers uh, in Portugal, for example, and we hit already many kind of barriers on the real life projects right now where these topics are, are, are crucial and sensitive. But uh, in any case, I would say the best thing is really to plan at the same time the hydrogen, the PV, wind source, plus obviously, and I say this from the start, the off figure actually usually is the start. What do we do with the hydrogen? If this comes together, actually the project mm -hmm. should be a success. Thank you, Christian. Ulrich, what is your take on additionality? Do, do you think uh, we can find a, a balance here? Uh, yeah, I, I think Christian, he put it, uh, put it really well. Um, first and absolutely most important uh, from our view is that the intention here, uh, we absolutely fully subscribe to. Of, of course, it cannot be so that, that we, uh, we, we, we call the hydrogen uh, green or based on renewables and what it actually does is uh, eventually to, to keep uh, old fossil plants uh, alive. So, so the intention is, is very, very important. Uh, however, especially now, initially, getting projects off the ground is by itself extremely <laughs> difficult. It, there is so many chicken and egg uh, situations. So I do have some sympathy for this view of, 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 of figuring out um, a careful balance uh, for the next, let's say, five years or so. Uh, it's it's also extremely important that we do find a way to accommodate those off takers that really want to be on the forefront here. Also, maybe potentially, you know, funding things that are still not, um, you know, uh, viable, uh, and 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 that we need to put them off because uh, the electrons are not there. So. The next, this, this, uh, this kickoff process, uh, we need to find a balance. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and at the other end of the scale, sorry for, uh, I'll do it quick. At the other end of the scale, uh, what we're talking about here is that with, with getting to, 20, to, to, to net zero by 2050, we will have to increase um, electricity consumption with 150% or something like that. Uh, getting rid of fossil fuels from our current electricity system, I think that's going to be the least of our challenges. The mm -hmm. biggest of our challenges is to meet this enormous new demand. And at that point, it's not so, you know, electri new electrons in the grid, they are from renewable energy to a great extent. So it's more in the mid in the midterm from 2025 maybe, and, and for the next uh, 10, 15 years, we need a uh, robust additionality criteria, no, no doubt.
Thank you. But so it, it's, it's indeed also in itself a chicken and egg because so basically if we are not able to provide this strong build out in the next five years, basically supposing that we have more flexible requirements for additionality, I guess there are things that actually need to happen in those five years because it's kind, being more flexible is conditional to then removing the bottlenecks. Otherwise, we will not get there. And then another aspect is uh, that in the meantime, maybe it's not a good idea to open all the pipes and just promote the use of so-called clean or low carbon hydrogen uh, everywhere. So isn't prioritizing the end use a, a key piece of the equation here? Who would like to take this first? I, I think you're right. Uh, I think, uh, you know, having our eyes uh, focused on on accommodating the demand and uh, and and having some documentation as well is not is not is not about not caring for additionality at all that i don't think this is this is what uh, we're talking about but 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 being more uh, flexible going forward in addition i must also say that uh, solar pv has the advantage that it can be quickly built but maybe the disadvantage in most quarters that it's it's diff more difficult to scale. At the other other end of that scale, we have offshore wind, which is very easy to scale up, but it takes years to plan and to execute. So so thereby very very difficult to time with a certain size of electrolysis. This this is what we have to 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 try to to make work uh, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ulrich. Uh, coming back, maybe, uh, Christine, I'm sure you want to react. I first want to ask Arina one thing about the, the end use. So what are the best use cases? Looking at efficiency, looking at CO2 abatement, and looking at the renewable potential which we have. First, do you agree that we should prioritize thoroughly? And where should this renewable hydrogen go first? Yeah. No, really, it's a really important point that you bring up because I think first of all, I mean, we're at solar uh, at a solar summit here. So first of all, everything that can be electrified should be electrified. And I think here, this is really a clear message that we we have uh, from the green hydrogen side uh, because if we can use the electrons directly to electrify a process, be it in a hot cell based sector, we should do that and we should not lose the efficiency in converting it to hydrogen and then uh, use the hydrogen for the process. So that's a clear first message. But then we come to the sectors that are really hard to bet where we will need renewable hydrogen in order to decarbonize them. And there we also need to prioritize and make sure that uh, we don't put, let's say, the very valuable renewable resources and the renewable hydrogen in the wrong areas. And there mm -hmm. I think uh, there are sectors such as, for example, steel that are clearly very difficult to decarbonize and where hydrogen can be really simple, let's say, uh, put in place solution. You have other sectors, uh, such as, for example, the fertilizer industry. Here, from a technology te technological point of view, it's relatively easy to decarbonize from a process perspective, uh, using a renewable hydrogen instead of gray hydrogen. Uh, and it has also a significant impact on the industrial emissions. This is also an area where we believe uh, we should use uh, renewable hydrogen. Then we have though other areas, let's say, um, such as, for example, methanol uh, production, where we believe, you know, it's really only makes sense when it's being used also in areas where you don't have an alternative so if i use that for example for uh, let's say road traffic uh, and i use methanol in a um, in a porsche for example we've seen area <laughs> projects around that that doesn't make a lot of sense to us because why not electrify that process directly so there mm -hmm. really we have to have let's say a prioritization of uh, abatement cost but also from a energy efficiency and co2 emission perspective where do we put uh, the renewable hydrogen. Happy to hear that we agree. Christian, some reactions? Yes, actually on both Karin and Ulrich for putting a, a topic which is implicitly inside. In fact, uh, looking to these off-taking routes, the derivative projects from hydrogen, the transport topic comes in, 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 into place because hydrogen is, a, is an element uh, difficult to transport until you have maybe a dedicated 100% pipeline network, which makes it then very competitive. But in the meantime, in order to make these uh, projects happen, either you have localized offtake and the electrolyzer just next to each other, or 
you go through a derivative like as we just heard from Karina, uh, uh, ammonia. Uh, also, I think uh, which have, we haven't elaborated too much in the transport side was uh, the aviation side. I mean, the, uh, there is obviously the, the cars, I fully agree, there are better options uh, than, than going with hydrogen, except some specific use cases. But um, uh, for the aviation, we have the quotas already defined by Germany. We have the new targets by Germany, which are even uh, stronger uh, than before, given the very interesting, sorry to mention it in this panel as well, but I was excited about this kind of uh, court decision, yeah, imposing, all right, the targets we were already very happy about, but they are still not enough to protect our future generations. And so by that, really these increased targets uh, uh, impose that also on these uh, sectors like mobility, heavy, heavy uh, transport, aviation, quotas to make, um, if you transform hydrogen to these fuels, then you can transport them with the conventional routes. And uh, this is actually the killer of many uh, business cases right now. You make the hydrogen maybe halfway acceptable, but then you calculate how to transport it where it's needed and then it's a problem until we have the pipelines and last comment we need to build the pipelines now or work on it that in 10 15 years we have them so it's no time to wait okay so we build the grids we build the pipelines it's quite a big a big piece of work ahead of us just a question uh to you Ulrich, as well in terms of the political message before i i enter the the closing round because we have four minutes left one thing that's important for investors is also political signal, clarity, ambition. Do you feel from, from, from your side that the European Union is clear? Do, do, you, do you feel that the focus is indeed all along the way through the instruments, through the alliances that have been developed, is the focus on renewables or uh, do we need a bit more confidence or uh, reassurance for, from policymakers in this regard today? I think I'm going to give you a, a maybe a, a, a slightly surprising response, uh, Aurélie. So I am the head of regulatory affairs uh, at Ørsted. I, I, people would assume that I get my salary from, from complaining about the lack of clarity and progress. And you are in an interest organization and you, you, are, you are trained to do the same. I, in, in this case, I would honestly say that the level of commitment, dedication, and progress on policy making is, is frankly unprecedented. I, I really do think that that has made the difference if, across the table with all industries. Now, today, all industries actually do believe and do see that this is going to happen. And I think that comes from political signals uh, globally, uh, within the European Union, uh, the European Commission, and nationally, of course. So, of course, uh, always room for improvement. And, and uh, you know, when you get to a certain stage, you want more clarity, you want more action. But the uh, net zero target, the fit for 55 commitments, uh, the hydrogen strategy, the other strategies, we are, we are in there in the uh, you know we have our our sleeves uh, 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 up and uh, people are working uh, I, I i think it's actually i think we're doing the right things uh, and um, uh, i'm i'm very confident mm -hmm. thank you that's a perfect transition to my closing uh, questions uh, at the end of the day ulrich and i'm even happy if you say that we are doing well because i think one thing that we can definitely give uh, to, to the latest, uh, to the European Commission in the past years is really that we have seen a big shift in ambition and that's true. We are already reopening and increasing ambition in a package that we struggled to adopt only two days ago and it's quite crazy to see that we're already aiming higher, so, so fully on board with you uh, when it comes to that. Then we also agree that from ambition to the ground, you need to have some some good elements in place which is maybe why i will then ask you all uh, to to sum up maybe quickly on on the fit for 55 package which is going to come we have a lot of legislative initiatives this year what do you think will be the most important element to to address in order to kickstart this renewable hydrogen economy and maybe then i will start with you ulrich uh, and go to our other panelists afterwards i, I would highlight uh, three things uh, uh, all, all things that we have already addressed here. The, the, the first thing is that 
uh, most important is to get projects off the ground at a certain at a certain level so that we can start to learn so that we can start to industrialize along the value chain and in the ideal world projects should have a business case built on a l lots of regulatory uh, things steering the renewable energy steering the demand for aviation fuel and green steel and so on and so on and so on and I frankly don't think we have time to wait for that. We need to, to, to get started. Secondly, um, the, the additionality discussion that we had, which is part of the package, that is going to be very, very important in my view, striking the right balance. And, and, and finally, since I am the offshore wind guy in the panel, uh, there is also a lot of details in that that needs to be worked out with huge potential but unfortunately also thereby potential for, for mishap. Thank you, Ulrich. Karina? Yeah, I thank you, Ulrich. For, I, I fully agree with you. There is a lot, let's say, uh, that's already been done and um, there's a lot to come. And I think the devil is in the detail. So I think they really need to be careful uh, when it comes, for example, to the definition of uh, renewable hydrogen, what is renewable, what is not renewable. And also, um, I think definitions in general, and that I, I would really highlight also from the demand side, are quite crucial. There we see the question is, what is green steel? What is green cement? From the demand side, really, what are all those, let's say, products that we're trying to define, that we're trying to decarbonize, and trying to also not only look at the upstream part and defining all of that well, the additionality, et cetera, but also what does that mean downstream? What do we want to achieve, really, for the product? And I think that's there is a bit of a lack there, and I would really highlight that. Thank you. Clarity, transparency, very important indeed in complement to what uh, Ulrich said. Christian, as our Renewable Hydrogen Vice Chair, what should we be doing next and also hearing about uh, the views of our co-panelists? Yes, well, we have uh, many initiatives, but I just want to pick in the end uh, one additional topic and it's all about decarbonization. And there must be an incentive for those industries who decide to go into decarbonization that they have a reward. So actually the CO2 emitted everywhere should be actually uh, uh, paid for uh, without uh, so many exceptions as they are now. It really needs to, to hurt where you continue uh, emitting CO2 instead of innovating, investing into innovation and making these projects then from the offtake side possible. So the CO2 price the, uh, the, the related uh, trading system uh, or whatever measure there is discussion how to how to uh, do this in future but it needs to be implemented that there is a, a clear uh, business case on based on on this uh, mechanism Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you very much uh, to you three, Ulrich, Karina. I think with the three of you and your summing up remarks, we have the perfect uh, Fit for 55 package. So now let's get to work in order to having, uh, have it on the ground. Uh, we will continue our exchanges, obviously, but thank you so much for the nice discussion today. If on the other side of the audience, you would like to know more, you can still, of course, go check, of course, the, the website of the Renewable Hydrogen Coalition, which is also an initiative putting together uh, Wind Europe, Solar Power Europe, and companies from all across the renewable hydrogen uh, value chain. I hope you have enjoyed this session as much as I did. Thanks again to, to everyone. Uh, renewable is indeed the missing link of Europe's decarbonization strategy, and we need uh, very committed uh, companies in order to unveil the new market opportunities which we have. We hope that we can also make it a win-win opportunity for our own sector and also for our businesses. Just recalling that the, the impressive falling costs of renewables are becoming uh, really a game changer, also on this side uh, of, the, um, of the whole political agenda. But we still need support to ensure this build out and we will work very hard for this in the next years. So thanks a lot, everyone. I think uh, you have earned uh, the possibility of a short uh, break before we take up to our final session of the day, which is uh, the Solar Startup Award. So that, that is our fourth or fifth edition already, but very successful. So please uh, stay tuned with us, enjoy a short break. And once again, thank you very much to, to our panelists. Goodbye. Goodbye, thank you.